Hi guys, so before we get into it, a very quick disclaimer that you'll find all my other Amicus reviews in my Amicus playlist and there will be spoilers today for I, Monster, a film which I found somewhat tricky to search for in the beginning, don't forget that apostrophe, if you do then this movie might not come up for you, so... Amicus released this one between their anthology films, The House That Dripped Blood and Tales from the Crypt. And I would suggest that at this stage of the game, and, and bear in mind we're halfway through this review series already, they were still struggling with their standalone feature films. I mean, they'd done some good ones up until this point. Scream and Scream Again, uh, The Skull, The Deadly Bees. All good films, but they not made a real knockout hit you know uh, a film to put their hat on and say that they'd arrived uh, with these sorts of films i mean their anthology films going great guns but the standalones not so much and actually with this one i'd say that they would taken a step backwards rather than a step forwards i knew nothing about i monster until i watched it even at the point i was putting the disc into the machine i'd not even read a blurb so i had no idea what was about to greet me and what I got was a kind of Jekyll and Hyde ripoff. So the story for this, we've got this character, Dr. Moreau or Munro, something like that. Marlow, that's it. And he lives in Victorian London, just picture cobblestone streets, horses and carriages. Everybody's either rich or poor. And, and you can sort of imagine that the general location and time frame. Marlow is keen to explore the depths of the human mind so he comes up with this drug and once you take it you lose your inhibitions and you just go straight for your deepest darkest desires regardless of whether it's appropriate or regardless of whether it's even lawful so for example he gives this young woman the drug very early on in the film she's a very reserved quiet type she's got her hair done up she's probably a, a church going type girl very you know, quiet and reserved. But what, as soon as she's taken the drug, she starts acting on her deepest desires, which is to get a guy, seemingly. And she just throws herself straight at Marlow. She's like a dog on a dog walk. The next person to take the drug is a guy, and he's really bossy and brash before he takes it. But as soon as he's had it, he becomes completely the opposite. He's down on his knees, being all submissive. And we can clearly see that his deepest desire is to not have to make any decisions in his life, just have other people do it for him. So you get the idea. And if you haven't predicted it already, eventually Marlow himself takes the drug, but he becomes some kind of human monster. His deepest desire is basically to just go around being nasty to people and hurting them in any way that he can. He's a, he's a threat to society. He's, he's awful. This is who he wants to be deep down, seemingly. And if this all sounds like uh, a Jekyll and Hyde type plot, then you're absolutely on the money. All the way through this film, I was thinking of uh, Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde, that Hammer film, which coincidentally came out in the same year as this. But I Monster is hugely inferior, I would say, to Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde. This one has Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing, and it still can't compare uh, to the other one. It's like Hammer and Amicus were having a battle of the Jekylls and Hydes in 1971. This story was taken from a Robert Louis Stevenson novella, I think, and Milton Sabotsky has basically come along, taken that story and written a screenplay from that, but he's changed all the names, uh, you know, so Jekyll is now Marlow. So they didn't want to have this be an official Jekyll and Hyde thing for some reason, but it still feels exactly like that. But it's just not got the same... Uh, world building as Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde. Uh, it's not as expansive. The, the story is very uninspired for me, and we'll get into some of the, the reasons why that is. The choice of director is very interesting. Uh, Stephen Weeks, he was only 22 years old at the time that he did this. He'd never done a movie before. He only went on to do a handful afterwards, films that I'd never heard of, and according to his wiki page, he was done by his mid-30s. But why just hire a random 22-year-old debutante to come and direct Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing. Very, very strange that you'd have these horror megastars and, and to direct them, you just pick a guy fresh out of college. I 
I struggled a bit with the story for this. Even though Marlowe is the main character, I never really fully understood all of his leaps in logic, all of the decisions that he makes. If we compare this film to The Curse of Frankenstein, which sort of plays like a Jekyll and Hyde film in many respects, I totally get all the decisions that Frankenstein makes through at least half the story. I understand why he's pursuing this science. I understand why, after the success with the animal experiment, he would then think to move on to humans. I'm kind of like the viewer version of the Paul character. And... I only do a 180 on the whole thing around about the same time that Paul does in that movie. But for, for a lot of that film, I, I, I'm totally on board with everything the main character is doing. And I understand why he's doing it. In I, Monster, I don't really feel that way for any of it. I, I don't see the point in pursuing this uh, drug to re reduce people's inhibitions. What's the point of that? There's an experiment on an animal early on, which, unlike in The Curse of Frankenstein, goes badly wrong. Uh, I mean, Marlowe ends up having to beat a cat to death <laughs> just to stop it acting in a really weird, aggressive, dangerous manner. And I just think to myself, OK, why after this would you then move straight to the human trials? It's a bit like betting £5 at the horse races and losing because you don't know what you're doing. And then thinking that the solution to that is to bet £100 on the next race. Because if we just go bigger, it will all sort itself out somehow. That's what Marlowe does in this movie. It doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. Even when he starts taking the drug and he sees what it's doing to himself, it doesn't really make sense to me that he would keep taking the drug. I mean, I guess you could say he's, he's addicted to it, but I don't know. And something else that I struggle to come to terms with in this is the fact that Nobody recognises uh, Marlowe in his alter ego because all Christopher Lee is doing is screwing his face up once he takes the drug. So he goes from looking pretty normal like this to looking like this. I can't even do it. It's something like that. He, he looks a bit like the Welsh actor Reese Ethans when he's uh, doing his grin. I'm not saying Ethans is, is an ugly guy or anything like that, but just the, 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 the general facial expression reminded me of Ethans. It's a bit like... Yeah, but the fact that people don't recognise him when he's walking around being a dick, uh, it sort of broke my immersion a little bit in this movie. I mean, if I came onto the camera one day and did a movie review, but the person who came on was me doing this. Hi, so I'm Monster. Uh, it's not one of America's best films. I much prefer The House That Drip Blood. I mean, you'd, you'd recognise that it was me, right? You wouldn't just think that it was some random guest presenter called Edward Blake. Um, and, and this is the, the problem that I had with the Hammer take on Jekyll and Hyde, the, the early 60s one, which, which just happened to have Christopher Lee in it. I'm pretty sure that one of the biggest reasons I wasn't sold on that film was that the transition uh, from Jekyll to Hyde was really awkward and it didn't really make a lot of sense. Other people's reactions to him didn't make a lot of sense. The Jack, uh, the Sister Hyde one uh, from 71 with Ralph Bates, much better. I mean, the science is really wonky, having a man turn into a woman and back again. But at least when Martine Beswick's running around with a knife, I could believe that people would look at her and not see Ralph Bates, if you see what I mean. Um, but in this film, I mean, you've got the main protagonist, Peter Cushing, bumping into Christopher Lee and not recognising him as the same bloke he saw 20 minutes ago. It... Uh, it it's just something that bugged me throughout this. I just think that maybe they needed another way around it somehow. I've got issues with the Peter Cushing character as well. He's playing a scientist in his own regard, possibly. But he seems to be retired because he spends all of his evenings just sat around in the local gentleman's club with a bunch of other old guys just talking about various intellectual topics it doesn't look very lively this place there's no music come to think of it i don't think we see any of the other patrons apart from the ones who were actually talking but never mind marlow himself turns up to these meetings but he he looks like he really doesn't want to be there which makes me think well why does he go in the first place but i guess he has to so that these other characters can notice that marlow exists and therefore when 
bad things start to happen in the local area, one or all of them can then investigate Marlowe, mainly Peter Cushing's character. But the fact that he doesn't recognise that Edward Blake is Marlowe was really problematic for me. It just made me feel like the character was really naive. I think that what they should have done is have Cushing figure this whole thing out very early on in this film and then struggle to convince the rest of the world. That would have been a better approach for me. Or maybe have the whole film set from Cushing's point of view and make the whole Marlowe character a mystery, somebody we, we, we only see here and there. They could have done it that way. That, that might have differentiated it more from the Hammer... Jekyll and Hyde films. There are some positives, uh, mainly in the action. There's a great chase between Marlowe and a prostitute that goes here, there and everywhere through some kind of factory setting. And right at the end, there's a, a climatic battle between Lee and Cushing. Uh, so for the umpteenth time, they go head to head to, to end a movie and there's glass smashing and a stuntman on fire. It's all good stuff. Um, but going back to that bit with the, the, the prostitute... Another bone of contention with me in this movie is the degree of monsterness, <laughs> that's not a word, that Marlowe uh, demonstrates once he's taken the drug. Because with a title like I, Monster, you would think, oh, well, you know, as soon as he takes the drug, it's going to be like a slaughterhouse. He's going to kill all these people. He's going to be like Jack the Ripper. Is it, the film's going to end with like 20 bobbies having to charge up the stairs. There'll be like crowds with pitchforks outside and stuff like that. It'll be epic. But it's not, because actually Edward Blake is not that nasty. Like He spends a good chunk of the film just going around, like, elbowing people. He, he, he grabs this guy, puts a knife to his throat, and then doesn't slit his throat. He's like, ah, ha, ha, almost killed you there. And it's like, are we going to see like a, a monster at some point? He goes and pays for a prostitute with cash. Oh, you monster, you, paying for sex, you know. Uh, I mean, he does eventually kill that prostitute, but only once she's rebuked him. If she hadn't, would Edward Blake just had sex with her and then gone home without doing the murder? I don't think there's any more than the one murder committed by Edward Blake in this film. If there is, I've already forgotten it, but... He spends more time in this doing really mundane things to people rather than extremely nasty things to people. I, I think my defining memory of the film will be Christopher Lee just like nudging people out of the way in the alley. And I don't know, are we supposed to sit there going, somebody get that monster off the streets before he bruises someone? Time to show you the version of the film that I've got for this. Here is my indicator version of I, Monster. It cost me about £13, maybe. It's been a while since I bought anything by indicator. I've got a few Hammer releases by indicator, though usually the sort of Hammer films that I wouldn't go back to, things like The Snorkel. And I think the 1960 Jekyll and Hyde film that also has Christopher Lee in might be uh, one that indicator did. I'm not sure... But there's loads of features on here. Uh, the, the film is a 2K restoration. That's the first thing to say. It looks bloody good. And there's an audio commentary with the director, Stephen Weeks, that was done in 2020. Um, another commentary featuring Weeks and film scholar Sam Umland. Lots of mini docs and bits and pieces. Lot, lots to get your teeth into if you are into this movie. But personally i've not checked out any of the features I, I just i just didn't enjoy the film enough in all honesty though i'm sure if i could just sit and watch one of the commentaries i, I would learn a lot more about i monster shall we get to the bag of terror and find out what score i'm going to give this so we've got one and two bloody axes out of five i was tempted to go to two and a half just because it, it, it almost feels blasphemous giving a, a leon cushing movie less than half the available marks but that's just how i feel about this one in all honesty if i feel like watching this film i'm just going to watch dr jekyll and sister hyde instead that's the bottom line before i wrap up today another quick update as to how i'm getting along with my stephen king read along so i've started reading all the stephen king books in chronological order i've finished carrie and i've now finished salem's lot i think salem's lot is an improvement over carrie really really cool and i've just started reading the Shining. I've read this one before years ago. I'm about 10 chapters into it. I've just got to the point where the characters reach the overlook. But 
going back to Salem's Lot, I really enjoyed that. In fact, I've bought the Blu-ray uh, for the, the Salem's Lot TV mini series, so I'm going to watch that pretty soon. And I guess that just about wraps us up for today. So that was my review of I, Monster, and I think the next Amicus film, as I hinted earlier, will be back to the anthologies with Tales, of the, uh, Tales from the Crypt, rather. So until next time, cheerio, bye-bye. <laughs>